It's about time. We are doing a Genshin Impact lore and theory deep dive. We're going to be watching every single one of Island XD's videos that I could find. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it because I love Island. He's a good friend. We chat every now and then. And I'm looking forward to see what his videos are actually like instead of just saying, I hope they're really good. Now I can actually say if they're really good. So let's have a look. Venti and the God of Time. I am excited. Let's do this. In this video, we will discuss the importance of God the of volumes, Time okay. and Wind to theorize the meaning of Genshin Impact as a whole. Also why Saritza, Abyss Order, and Kenria are so obsessed with Barbados and Mondstadt. It True. starts right now. Right here, right now? The very first thing that we think of when discussing the God of Time is its identity. However, tackling the identity of God of Time is a difficult thing to do. Frankly, there's not Gotta enough be information, on. and whenever the God of Time is mentioned in the game, things get very confusing because of its cryptic nature. But to get some answers to theorize the overall story of Genshin Impact, well, we I also have the island. A different question: right? <laughs> Why is the God of Time yeah, so this important? One. To answer this question, let's dissect some hints related to the God of Time. Okay. The sundials from the quest Time and Wind states seeds of stories brought by the wind and cultivated by time yep stories brought on the wind will bloom into legends in due time the traveling scholar sayed is also found reciting a poem seeds brought on by the wind will sprout in due time oh shit. even okay. the eye of the storm speaks an ancient tale comes whist in the wind in time it will grow and sprout once again what? From these three information, we can notice a very important concept. Time and wind cannot exist without the other. Without time, the stories, legends, and tales have no place to exist. And without stories, legends, and tales, time itself serves no purpose. I mean, In a true. symbolic sense, wind and time is one. This is cool. So this Even is before Enconomia. They could be two different things. It is. This world and its history exists because of the God of Time and Wind. Now, as I mentioned, the God of Time is currently unidentified within yep. the story. But we do know that the God what? of Wind okay, is don't... identified within the story. But we do know that the God <laughs> of Wind is undoubtedly our carefree bard from Mondstadt, Venti. Yes. Yeah, this is During an old video. This is one of Island's first demo, videos, chat. Mihoyo gives us a brief description Remember of to bear that in mind. identity. Full of mystery, born from the branches of time, a history of glory and sorrow, and witness to the divine. Mm. From this description, I would argue that Venti was born from the foundation of time itself. Wisp of wind that existed before the formation of the seven archons as we know today. Mm. Interestingly, this description also suggests that he yeah. witnessed many rise and fall of the world. Was this before glory and sorrow? This can't be before Venti's story quest, right? The history of the world, <laughs> what signifies its rise and fall, the beginning and the end? The moon. Oh no, Just that's like why Paimon asks if is related, that guy sells the moon. The moon, moon is also <laughs> another variable that coexists with time and history. Moon symbolizes the renewal of time or the cycle of time itself. Now okay. to backtrack a bit, earlier we mentioned the sundial. The sundial from the quest Time and Wind, which hints towards the relationship between God of Time and Wind. However, I'm under the impression that these sundials, although mentioned in the game as a sundial, are in fact moon dials. Oh, what? Just like the sundials, moon dials were used to track time and history. Now, during the quest, we are directed to take certain actions between 2 to 5 in the morning. Oh, the exact true. time frame where the moon is casting a shadow over the needle. Oh, Not wait, only that's that, true. The moon is also hinted several times within the game itself, relating to time or wind. Resins, which we all despise, are shaped as a moon, which accumulates over time continuously. The name Mondstadt, the wait, region what? of the Animo Archon, even means the moon city. Now, if you're still not convinced, inside the book Heart's Desire, it further wait, hints the moon's. Wait, I'm sorry. This makes this kind of makes too much sense. <laughs> Th this makes too much sense. Association. Reaching. I don't. That's a, it's 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 theory crafting. You can't reach. It's it's literally theory crafting. This is this is great. Barbados There's no reach. And the God of Time. 
The book tells a story of three Moon sisters named Aria, Sonnet, and Canon, which are all related to poetry, stories, and ballads. Now with that in mind, the story within the sacrificial weapons state, On the cliff facing the eastern sea, the ancestors worshipped the masters of time and the Nemo together. Oh. The people of Mondstadt had a tradition of building theaters on top of windy cliffs to please the gods. Rituals took the form of performances for they believed that gods enjoyed stories and ballads. Now obviously this cliff facing the eastern sea is undoubtedly the Thousand Winds Temple on the yeah. eastern coast of Mondstadt. The it makes sense. The same location where the sundial or the moon dial as I call it is located. I'm sure you get the point. Do we so ever have to do anything with that one? Between time, wind, and the moon signify in Genshin Impact. What is it, Island Sasuke? Cyclical life? The history of the world is constantly repeated due to the... This is very interesting because I also think there's something to do with cyclical life in Genshin. Especially with the fact that our sister or your brother, depending on who you play as the, as the main protagonist of the story, um, says like, oh... Uh, there's always going to be time you're going to basically follow in the, my footsteps and, and we'll meet eventually, blah, 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 whatever. I think I think cyclicality is a, is a big thing in a Existence lot of games at the minute. I think time, it's great. Wind and the moon. Without the gods of time and wind and the moon, the cyclical nature of life in Genshin Impact is fractured and ceases to exist. Now, yep. if you've been paying attention to the story, I'm sure you've noticed by now <laughs> the Fatui. Abyss Order and Kenria all seems to be connected to our carefree bard and Mondstadt in some way. According to Jean, the Cryo God has always trumpeted the Animo God's power, particularly after the Cataclysm when Sarissa's ideals changed. In the case of the Abyss Order, during the Cataclysm, they specifically targeted Dragonspine, a region within the needle. Mondstadt. And even today, they are constantly found trying to weaken Mondstadt, lurking around the Four Winds Temple, and even corrupting the Volin. For Kemria, they sent Kaya specifically to Mondstadt as their last hope after the events of the Cataclysm. Why Mondstadt? What the fuck? Why not Liyue or Inazuma? So the question is, why? Why are they so obsessed with Barbados and Mondstadt? Inside the world of Good Genshin question. Impact, no matter what happens throughout time, the wind continues to push time forward as the moon signifies the start and the end of a cycle. A cyclical life that continues for an eternity for humanity, even if there is a cataclysm. Yeah. Now, who do I think the God of Time actually Rosia is? Dark Souls. Is it the sustainer? Paimon? Barbados himself? Paimon. Or is it someone else unknown to us no, at the current not. moment? <laughs> With the lack of conclusive evidence, it's really difficult to make a determination. But if I were to take a shot in the dark, forgetting about the lore and just going with my guts, my random guess Paimon? would have to be Paimon. Yeah! <laughs> Who do you think the God of Time could be? Make sure you comment down below if you have any guesses. Now, unfortunately for Barbados, I don't think it's become Paimon. the target to the Fatui, I think we know now, right? and Kenria, name. who are all trying to overthrow the cyclical nature of this world. Maybe that's why Barbados has been always hiding. But is this really Barbados' fault? The fact is, he has to continue to push time forward because of his nature of existence. Mm. The story within Genshin Impact is beginning to shift. The cataclysm as the seed. So instead of trying to figure out who is in the right or Mona's wrong, gotta know a lot. I believe it's imperative for us to understand what the exact cause of the cataclysm was. Is it as simple as the Abyss Order just being pissed off at the gods and humans? Yes. Or is there a deeper <laughs> meaning behind nope. it all? I really hope no. I really hope there is just that meaning where they're just pissed off at each other. <laughs> Next video is going to be the true meaning of cataclysm with, uh, obviously, Ireland. I'm excited. This video contains spoilers. Oh, no. Look away, chat. But yeah, thank In you, Jojo. In this video, we will discuss the reason behind the cataclysm 500 years ago. We mm. will also speculate on what the Fatui, Abyss Order, and Kenria are all planning. It Island, I need, right I need to hear your thoughts on, on Camrya and, and Kaya in game, general. Throughout the game, we are constantly reminded of a cataclysm that happened 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. An incident that changed the view of the Saritza 
an occurrence closely tied with Barbados and the dragons Devolin and Durin. Also an event that destroyed a civilization in Kenria. So what was the cause? I believe that the reason behind the cataclysm has a deeper secret, which was oh. hinted to us by Mihoyo from the very beginning in plain sight. <gasps> Doors. Oh. If that you're makes not familiar sense. with the symbol, I will give you a brief description. The symbol, called the Triquetra, dates back to the Iron Ages. Jeez. In spiritual practice, this symbol represents the concept of unending continuation. Life, death, and rebirth. Now, alongside this Triquetra symbol... Yo, so, uh... <clears throat> life, death, rebirth. That reminds me. Uh, uh... Yeah, Senora's not fucking dead. Anyway, carry we on. We also see a similar symbol littered everywhere in the game. The Quaternary. Quaternary, or also known as a Quaternary Knot, symbolizes mm -hmm. four directions or seasons. Now, for the sake of our theory, Ooh. let's focus on the meanings behind these two symbols. Okay. Triquetra, the cyclical life, and Quaternary, the symbol of division within the cyclical life. You know, seasons. Now, how do these two things answer our question behind the cataclysm? The short if you're answer me, it is, doesn't. <laughs> in the world of ancient impact, humanity's cycle of life will always repeat itself. If this is hindered in any way, humanity goes poof. To unpack this <laughs> hypothesis, let's explore the hints within the game. These four oh, I, I artifacts love contain so many much, symbolisms poof. to the cyclical life and its divisions. The TLDR of the story goes something like this. During the civilization, humanity had the ability to communicate with Celestia directly. The gods help humans to prosper, over time, humanity begins to question the gods, and the gods did not answer. So, hmm. humans went into the depths of this world for answers. After a while, humans grew prideful and ambitious and tried to force their way into the garden of the gods. The gods got pissed off. So beautiful. Now, to briefly go over the divisions or seasons within the story, in those days, life was weak and the earth was blanketed in unending ice. This signifies humanity's struggle without the guidance of the gods. Eternal ice begins to thaw, and the first fires were still new. Humanity's prosperity under the gods spark curiosity, and humans begin to question the gods. Ancient flames were extinguished amidst the first falling rain. Humans begin to thirst for knowledge and the truth. Waters ran dry as thunder first Jesus. pierced the skies. Artifacts have a lot of lore inside them. The gods. Now, if we take the hints given from these artifacts, the words spoken by the sustainer of heavenly principles in the very beginning of the game start mm -hmm. to make more sense. Irrigation of mankind. Now, if the cataclysm was caused by humanity's rebellion against the gods or irrigation of mankind, I want the and wings. the cyclical life is destined to continue, what are the Fatui, the Abyss Order, and Kenria planning? Rebellion? Oh, God. The Fatui, Abyss Order, and Kenria all share a few commonalities. Their opposition to the order of this world and once the rebels end did. the cyclical life in Genshin Impact. For Saritza, we can find that she is planning to rebel against the Divine in the Travail trailer. Chat, For it's Lumine, fine. Manga spoilers, I have no context at all. United trailer Don't worry. States, Until the Abyss has engulfed the thrones, my war with Destiny will see no end. Destiny derives from the translated word Chun-Li in Chinese or huh? Chun-Li in Korean. Both Ooh. literally means decree of heaven or order of the world. In the case of Day's life and the views of Ken Ria, he openly states that he detests deities in Ganyu's trailer and even continues in the Travail trailer saying that the people from Ken Ria will defy this world with the power from beyond. Now I speculate that the power from beyond means non-elemental powers that are not associated with the gods. Uh, now, although their methods it definitely may be could. different, their goals Illusions? are the same. To end the cyclical life predestined by the divine. Now as I mentioned in the previous episode, Barbados' relations with cyclical life poses a problem to these factions. Even if Barbados dislikes the idea of ruling and enforcing laws, and even if he hates Celestia, 
His existence holds the key to the cyclical nature of this world. This becomes Goddamn. even more clear at the end of Dainsleif's quest. Holy shit. How Down does a lion. flower explain Barbados' significance to cyclical light? In the We Will Be Reunited trailer, Lumine comes across a flower, the dandelion. Now, if you've completed this quest and watched this trailer before, it's easy to assume that this dandelion in the trailer is in fact the same dandelion at the end of Dainsleif's quest. This, mm -hmm. however, is false. That'd be way Upon too easy. Upon <laughs> completing the quest and rewatching the trailer, I spent hours trying to find the exact location. Wait, I thought it was the same this one. Dandelion in the trailer. Then when I found the actual location, I actually felt really stupid because it was so obvious. The Thousand Winds Temple, a location related to the god of time, wind, and the moon. Now, if we take a step back and dissect the meaning of the dandelion, one thing becomes very clear. The dandelion is the prime example of cyclical life. I understand that other plants also go through the same cycle of life, huh. death, and rebirth. So what's so special about the dandelion? A dandelion's life cycle hinges on one crucial factor. Wind. Without the wind, its cycle of life cannot continue. Taking things even further, mm, that is true. has a subtle symbolism inside the trailer. Lumine comes across this dandelion and cherishes it for a fleeting moment, only to be trampled, symbolizing <laughs> Lumine's ultimate goal, to end the cyclical life created by the gods. Jesus now the Christ. question is, why did Mihoyo use two dandelions from different locations? In my personal opinion, this symbolizes the separation between Aether and Lumine. But by using the dandelion, this suggests that Aether and Lumine are in fact related, figuratively and literally. Now whether but this is true or not is up for debate, but one thing is for certain. Huh? The sheer amount of hints given to us between the god of wind and cyclical life cannot be understated. But was that not it's known? It's hinted that the role of Barbados may actually be necessary for the story to unfold. Let's take a look at the prayers to the firmament. This is the fifth prayers artifact. The story of this artifact goes something like this. After humans attempted to enter the garden of the gods, things settled down by the intervention of the wind. But humans still reached out to the island in the sky, hoping that its promises were real. To uncover the truth, the chief priest goes into the depths of this world. There he finds a warning. The truth that no one wants to hear. The lore within these artifacts the end goals could are possibly be a foresight or a parallel to the events of the cataclysm. The intervention of the wind, which was necessary to prolong the total destruction of humanity. Jesus. But after this intervention, some uncovered the truth behind this world. Undoubtedly, Fatui, Abyss Order, and Kenria all knows this truth, which is probably the reason why they are trying to rebel against the divine. But why it does makes a lot of sense. this truth end in the destruction of humanity? What is the secret of Celestia and the true meaning of this world? Does make a lot of sense. Couple of points that I want to make before we even start the next one. Exilus, I think, uh, <laughs> I agree. A lot of it is stretching, but I will also say, I, I think that's the beauty of theories. I think, uh, I think theories, if they're too on the surface is just, you know, I think they can be a bit boring. This one is Celestia's darkest lies. It's an episode three. What is Celestia hiding? In this video, I will give you my take on Celestia and lies based on real life references that Mihoyo used to create Genshin Impact. It starts right now. Right now, baby. What right here, right now. What is the true meaning of this world? Before I give you my theory on this subject, I think it's best for me to describe where I'm getting this information from. Mihoyo bases a lot of things in Genshin Impact from the concept of Gnosticism. Gnosticism oh, goes the, something the, like this. The Gnosis. There is the original god known as the Monad. For our sanity, let's call this god Big Daddy. <laughs> Big Daddy creates aeons, giving. Sorry, YouTube thumbnail. Save that for Big later. Big Daddy creates aeons, giving them similar <laughs> divine powers. One of these aeons, called Sophia, creates Demiurge. Jesus Again, Christ. for simplicity's <laughs> sake, let's call Demiurge the fake god. 
Like fake the news. Aeons, the fake god was also given divine powers. But after creating this fake god, Sophia becomes disgusted. She seals and casts away the fake god from the spiritual universe. Since this fake god this never manga saw stuff? any other divine beings, he believes that he's Big Daddy. So, the fake god creates the mortal realm and humanity. But just like Big Daddy and Sophia, the fake god unknowingly gives humans the potential for divinity. The whole premise of Gnosticism is this. If humans become knowing and achieve gnosis or understanding, they themselves can become divine beings. Now here's the problem. After creating the mortal realm, the fake god feels threatened. Why? Because humans keep trying to achieve godhood through knowledge. So, the Makes fake sense. god creates archons, and archons are given a job to preside over humanity and present obstacles so that humans will stay oblivious and do not reach the knowledge to become divine beings themselves. And upon seeing this, Big Daddy felt bad and sends two Aeons, <laughs> male and I female can't... pair, to help humans achieve the knowledge and I become can't take divine it seriously. beings. Doesn't this sound vaguely familiar? <laughs> No, well, yeah, but now let's from a take totally a few points from Gnosticism to answer some questions for the reasons why I believe Celestia is all a lie. Yeah, the fake god has an inferiority complex. He realizes that if humans achieve the understanding, they can ascend to be on the same level as himself. Ooh. So, to stop this from happening, the fake god uses archons to divert humans from achieving the knowledge throwing humans a bait with a false promise. Now, if we refer back to Venti's dialogue, he describes the Archon's job, to preside over or watch over their associated region and its people. If I take this and push it to the extreme, it could okay. also mean to keep an eye on humanity. But in the case of Barbados, he seems to disagree with I don't, I don't really think that's pushing it to the extreme, right? I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a fair assumption to to make. It's just a slightly different wording, in my opinion. I think that's a that's a solid theory. I don't think it's stretching too much. With this idea, and instead gives people of Mondstadt freedom, which is the reason why Barbados is so weak. And maybe also this is the reason why Barbados and Rex Lapis are okay to simply retire from the yeah. status of Archons, possibly because they don't agree with the fake god's ideals. And they both want to get drunk all day. True. The fake god is trying to trick humans and deter them from ascending. How is he doing it? What is the bait and the false promise? The visions and delusions, actually. You might think I'm crazy and I'm reaching really far, but please let <laughs> so, me... Hey, at least he's self-aware that you guys in chat that are like, this is a reach. Like, yeah, he knows, dude. That's what makes this so fucking fun. <laughs> crazy and I'm reaching really far, but please let me explain. Gnosis in Chinese means heart of God, oh. knowledge and understanding of divinity and the truth, something all archons know and were given to them along with the status of being archons. Visions, on the other hand, is translated the eye of God. Oh! In my hypothesis, visions are tools given to certain humans by the gods. These visions are used to keep an eye on certain individuals and to divert them from the truth that Celestia is fabricated. Now, do I have anything to back up this ridiculous claim? What do I mean Celestia is fabricated? Upon further research, I noticed Probably many not. strange things regarding Celestia. In this shot of Celestia in the manga, when Vanessa ascended, we actually get to see what's inside Celestia. Now to humans, Celestia is heaven. But when we look at this image, this doesn't really reflect my idea of heaven. It looks Vanessa's more like a tribunal. To a mixture of emotions as well. Rather than being heavenly, this image seems to reflect the opposite. So skated. Or to be specific, yeah. a panopticon. Yeah. The oh, of wow. The panopticon originated in the 18th century. The idea is simple. An institution. Hey, I've seen this before. This is where Rocket Raccoon steals that dude's leg in 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 Guardians of the Galaxy, dude. To observe all things from a singular location. If my theory of visions being it's a, a prison. diversion or a bait is correct, these visions are used by the fake god to keep an eye on certain individuals. 
If the fake god feels threatened by this individual, they are ascended into Celestia, a prison. To add to the theory of Panopticon, during our dialogue with Ningguang at the Jade Chamber, she speaks of the Jade Chamber as a tool to oversee everything in Li Wei. Similarly, Celestia accomplishes the same thing, keeping an eye over the entirety of Tavat. Mm. Now this might sound a bit dark, it may even sound like a conspiracy theory, but if you keep this theory in your mind, oh, the following no. dialogues by Dainsley from the Travail trailer starts to make sense. Go ahead, Island, go ahead, blow my mind. The war has already begun. The music. It is just a continuation of past battles. This refers to humanity's continuous struggle to uncover the truth, as they are constantly shut down by the fake god as the cyclical life of this world continues. The gods goad us on with the promise of their seven treasures. Rewards for the worthy, the doorway to divinity. The seven treasures meaning the seven elemental visions. The Makes gods sense. claim that this is for the worthy and for those who can ascend. Which I am theorizing that this is nothing but a lie and a bait. Yeah, I mean, how did Klee get one? Depths of this world lies smoldering remains. I'm sorry, I love her, but come on, dude. Trespass. This references that the truth lies within the abyss, a warning of what happens if you attempt to challenge the gods. That throne in the sky is not reserved for you. This phrase is quoted by Dainsleif, referring to someone else talking. Possibly quoting the sustainer oh. or the fake god talking to Aether or humanity. But mortal irrigation never stops. That word, it's obviously irrigation, referring dude. to the idea that humans repeatedly continue to question the gods and seek the truth. Skipping past few dialogues, Dainslave continues. In the perpetual meantime of a sheltered eternity, most are content to live and not to dream. This sheltered eternity representing the fabricated bubble of this world, where some continues to stay ignorant and live their lives under the fabricated lies of Celestia. But in the hidden corners where the gods' gaze does not fall, there are those who dream of dream. In Dayslave's words, hidden Jesus. corners representing Kenria, where the people continue to fight in hopes to reform this world. Some say a few are chosen and the rest are dregs. The piano is absolutely popping off right now, dude. <laughs> Dainsleif is suggesting that humans can take control of their own fate. Fate not predestined by the gods. God Whether damn. my theory is right or wrong Gigi. will be only determined with time. However, I feel that this is making way too much sense. The Dainsleif continues. He asks us to step forth if we understood the meaning of our journey. Tell us to defeat him and command him to move aside. What exactly is the meaning of our journey? What is the last thing that star. needs to be accomplished? Why does he want us to defeat him? I think it was just to prove ourselves. That's my that was my outlook on it, but I assume there's gonna be some kind of some kind of insane theory behind which it too. Strong. Oops. The truth behind delusions, which could be very, very interesting. Which is stronger? Vision or a delusion? How what is a delusion neither? and what's its purpose? What I think does a delusion this is stronger. have to do with anything? And how does this relate to the Fatui? Welcome to Genshin Theory. Jesus Christ. On okay. the surface, visions and delusions practically do the same thing. They give their users elemental powers. So why did the Fatui create delusions in the first place? Visions are given out to specific individuals by the divine under the pretext of ascension which I speculated in this video that it's all a lie and a bait. Now, Ooh. regardless of that, we know that Sarissa is planning to rebel against Celestia and the Divine. Did I miss In one? a very simple sense, she needs power, something she has unconditional control over, hence creating delusions and empowering her followers of the Fatui. But the question is, are delusions in fact stronger than visions? There's I think only that, the oh. ambassador in Mondstadt gives us some the hints regarding The fact that it sucks out question. life force? I don't know. Victor states, delusions are treasures of incredible power granted by Her Majesty, the Saritza, in person. Whether fate or vision, a delusion makes them all look like child's play. 
Now, obviously, Victor may not be the best reference to validate the power of delusions. I mean, let's face it, he's essentially a nobody. Yeah. The Senora practically forgot about him and left him here for months. But Oof, to fact of Victor's claim, let's refer to a much better source. The only person who Oof. we know currently that possesses oh, both vision and delusion. Child. My boy, who I once hated and now During adore. During our battle against Child, our question gets answered pretty clearly. In the first phase of the battle, we fight Child in his Hydro element, representing well. his vision's power. Then after we beat him up for a while, he gets Re mad and then he activates- Say represented his vision's power, representing the Genshin Clearly, Impact community, dude. In the first phase of the battle, we fight Child in his <laughs> Hydro element, representing his it. vision's power. Then after we beat him up for a while, he gets mad and then he activates the- Wait, I'm sorry, I, I don't usually like pausing too much, but did he say beat him up or beat him off for a while? Vision's power. Then after we beat him up for a while, he gets mad and then he activates the Electra element. I see illusion. you. Now, obviously, I'm speculating off of game mechanics, but what boss in any game powers down in their second phase? Not to mention, Senora literally wipes the floor against Venti, who has a Gnosis, a literal supercharged version of a vision. Very good I'm point. I'm sure you get the point. From using logic, we can deduce that delusions are in fact stronger than visions. I now agree. if we go back to Victor's dialogue, after mentioning the power of delusions, he continues. Still, not everyone can wield one. Beyond the 11 Harbingers, very few other Fatui possesses a delusion. Now if Sarissa's plan is to empower her followers using delusions, why no. is it that only few people can possess a delusion? Is it simply a symbol of status? No, it's not because we saw with Tepe, right? From the manga, we know that Diluc's father, Crepus, had a delusion. To save Diluc from the attack of Dragon Ursa, Crepus uses the delusion and ultimately dies by the delusion's power backfiring. Ooh. Why did it backfire? In the oh manga, God. Amber uncovers a note describing that the usage of delusions leaves a scent of mist grass. But what's even more interesting is the fact that Amber notices the same Man, scent of, of mist grass during an incident when Kolei uses her dormant powers to cause havoc. Now Kolei doesn't have a delusion, so what's the connection here? Her dormant powers originates from the Archon residue that was forcefully injected into her body by the Fatui in a way to manipulate her mental state to hate everything in the world at a young age. Now, due to this reference of scent from both delusions and Kolei's powers, it is my speculation that the power of delusions originated from the Archon Residue itself. Oh, so what? what in the world is an Archon Residue? Yeah. In my hypothesis, Archon Residue is the hatred, resentfulness, or twisted sense of logic left behind by the gods during the Archon War when they were defeated. If we were to consider this idea, the backfiring huh. of a delusion can be simple to explain. They backfire once you lose this sense of hatred or resentfulness. For two members that possesses delusions are the easiest to explain. Their excessive hatred and resentfulness towards the divine keeps delusions from backfiring. Now for Diluc, he is seen in the manga using his delusion what? safely while seeking revenge. Once he obtains closure at the end of the manga, he actually the throws phase. away the delusion. In essence, the delusion never really gets the chance to backfire. Now the same delusion actually backfires on his dad, Crepus, because he becomes content. What I mean by that is Crepus's goal that he never achieved were accomplished by his son, Diluc. His resentfulness subsided, and he was willing to accept his shortcomings and move on, but ultimately ends up using the delusion anyway to save Diluc from the dragon ending in his death. In the case of Kole, the Archon Residue initially doesn't backfire due to her hatred towards the world. Only after meeting Amber and slowly learning to Dude, accept That makes the new event with the Luke's little bit of backstory hit so much deeper. And I don't really mind that I'm finding out like quote unquote manga spoilers through this kind of context because it gives me the context that I need to know for this, but it doesn't spoil a lot of stuff in my opinion. Uh, also, people already basically spoiled the fact that what happened to Deluke's dad, just not how it actually happened. So I'm not that fussed. Um, but holy fuck, poor Deluke, dude. Peace. My God. She becomes conflicted and is unable to control her powers. 
Only after the power was sealed by the help of Sino, she was able to escape death and accept peace. Sino. However, Sino cautions that the next time this power releases, Kole will undoubtedly perish. Again, if we take the idea of delusions originating from the Archon residue, we can come up with some logical answers. But there is one thing I failed to mention. Why does the delusion and the power of the Archon residue give off the scent of mist grass? Mist grass or mist flower in the real world is known as gypsophila. Gypsophila mm. symbolizes purity, sincerity, love, compassion, and trust. I think Sino Similar would be my favorite character. That many speculated of Saritza in her past. But if we take the symbolisms of Mistgrass and try to connect some flowers with the resentment and the hatred of the Archon Residue, it's very conflicting. So what's the deal here? At its <laughs> core, regardless of its symbolism, the Gypsophila is considered an invasive species or weed. This oh, plant it's grows a weed. best when it's protected from the wind. Not Do the I weed. need to go further with this? Saritza's loving past and the nature of her current existence her history with Barbados and her goal to challenge Celestia through the usage of hatred and resentment. She can't do it, she's if getting high. Illusions are in fact stronger than visions. That's good news for Saritza. But it's hard to deny that this requirement that's needed to keep delusions from backfiring could be a hindrance. Perhaps this is why the Fatui is trying to infuse children with the Archon residue to manipulate their mental state at a young age. Jesus and if this Christ. is true, why? Where My did Saritza God. <laughs> get this idea from? Fucking hell, child! Tartaglia had a very interesting childhood. Wherever he went, he wrecked havoc and Don't make me hate him again. for battle. Not long after joining the ranks of the Fatui, he was inducted as one of the Harbingers and was acknowledged by the Saritza and I'm given not ready for the emotional delusion. whiplash of hating Child again. Interestingly, at the current moment of the game, Child is the only character that can use a vision and delusion at will. It's a character. I'm sorry. I, I beg that one day, I don't care when it is, I don't care if it's in 10 years, honestly. I beg that one day we get to... A, a playable character with a with a vision and a delusion that we can switch back and forth between using the elemental burst or something. Please, uh, please, I beg. It'd be so goddamn cool. Curious thing that the Saritza, who despises the gods, is okay with child using a vision when delusion is proven to be stronger anyway. Mm -hmm. But obviously, Saritza knows better. His foul legacy transformation. Contrary to some opinions, Foul Legacy Transformation is not a power created by a delusion. It's obvious from reading Child's backstory that this transformation power originated from the Abyss, from his master, Skirk. Now if you're Skirk. unfamiliar, there's a transformation method <laughs> the used Skirk? by the Abyss Order called the Abyssal Gospel. This was outlined during Dainslave's quest in the description of a dungeon. This transformation created the Abyss Herald. Oh, now, in my what? theory, this vow legacy transformation originated from the same source. Now, here's where Child gets even more interesting. Within this transformation, Child is able to utilize both his vision and delusion's power simultaneously, using both hydro and electro attacks in this form. The he only is problem insane. is this takes a toll on his body, and he cannot retain this form for a very long time. This could be due to the incompleteness of the current state of delusions. Oh. Delusions' inherent restrictions make it difficult when it tries to synergize with its opposite, the visions. All the meanwhile, using this altered transformation technique from the abyss to forcefully Dude. harness two elements together. How sick now does here's that a question look? For you. What would happen if a complete version of a delusion is achieved? Perhaps by directly injecting an Archon Residue in a human's body at a young age? Jeez. A complete internal delusion-like powers with no restrictions? And what would happen if Saritza had the ability to give visions at will to these individuals with no backfiring restrictions? Surely there's no way, right? It's not like she has the power of every element or anything. Imagine if she did it to Venny, then? Don't leave us with that island. Island, you're such a bitch. Surely there's no way, right? It's not like she has the power of every element or anything. Island, fuck you, dude. Come on. You gonna, you gonna, dude. <laughs> Are you fucking serious? You gonna, you gonna hit us with that? 
and, and le leave that video on that part, dude? Okay, okay, motherfucker. Okay, now we have a video that I'm very much looking forward to seeing because I saw the title of this and it made me, it made me uh, absolutely, like, Okay, I'm not going to say the word. I'm just excited for this one. Dainsleaf's true intentions. Now, I love Dainsleaf, so... Everyone is lying. Well, to be more specific, everyone is hiding something. What actually happened in Kamriya? What's he planning? And can know. we believe anyone in this game anymore? Nope. It starts <laughs> right now. No, we can't. <laughs> so throughout the Archon Quest, Dainsleaf attributes the fall of Kamriya to the gods. And we're told that the fallout of Kamriya created the abyss order now how much of it is actually true from my past videos i theorized that the Good divine question. has the capability to push the reset button on humanity but there's a clear distinction here advancement of human technology does not trigger this reset button inside genshin impact this reset is triggered when humans get too close to uncovering the truth of divinity Ooh. to give you an idea what i mean if the technological advancement was the reason, Hanria would have been destroyed years ago. During the Archon Quest, we are told that the Ruin Guards originated from Kanria. But how far back does it actually go? It's gonna Ujong, be. Ujong, the god of dust, wanted to study the oh. Ruin Guards' ancient technology. So she trapped them inside a domain that we end up entering throughout our gameplay. These Ruin Guards and Hunters were obviously trapped here before doesn't Guizhong have like a, a super, super, super like smudge backstory? Guizhong actually died thousands of years ago. Oh. With that said, if technological advances wasn't the trigger to the destruction of Kanria, Awkward. who triggered it? Before I explain, there are a couple points that we have to understand. It is my theory that Hilichuros and Abyss Order originate from two separate sources. Mm? According to the archives, Hilichuros existed well before the Cataclysm. It is my opinion that whenever the divine pushes the reset button on humanity, the humans turn into hilichuros that we know today. Ah, but what about the abyss order? I could see that to be According fair. According to the Archon quest, the I abyss could see that. order originated from Kanria. And in that quest, there is a peculiar dialogue between the two siblings and Dainsleif. Dainsleif failed to prevent the destruction of Kanria. He watched the people he was supposed to protect turn into monsters of the abyss. Interestingly, nowhere in this dialogue does our sibling mention about the gods turning humans into the monsters of the abyss or the gods causing the destruction of Kanria. But still, Dainsleif attributes the fall of Kanria to the gods. Why? Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> the alchemist known as Gold I was get corrupted it, but... by their own greed and ambition and created an army of shadowy monsters with their uncanny powers. Due to greed and ambition, possibly to uncover the truth behind this world, Gold caused the initial trigger which took down Kanria from within. Dainsleif being one yeah. of the royal guards of Kanria ultimately fails to prevent this internal conflict. In turn, he was cursed with immortality, probably by gold. Now, in a Ooh. very roundabout way, there is some merit on why Dainsley blames the god for this to begin with. None of this would have happened if the gods were being honest from the start anyway. Now, obviously, when humans figure it out, the gods press the reset button. Humans turn into Hilichuros, and the cycle repeats itself. Mm. So long story short, out of greed and ambition, gold creates monsters of the abyss order using the humans in Kanria, with the purpose of finding the truth hidden by the gods. So gold Dainsleif is a person fails to protect Kanria that I just don't know unable to stop gold, which explains his hatred towards the abyss order. And afterwards, the gods press the reset button due to gold approaching the truth and the remaining humans of Eclipse Dynasty turns into Hilichros. And to Dainsleif, no matter how it happened, it really just boils down to the gods lying anyway. Now, with that said, there is another reason why I think gold is the cause of all this. Oh, For a while, I suspected... Gold is the is the creator of Albedo and Durin? Oh, is that, oh, okay, okay. I don't remember the name being gold. Ryan Daughter? Yeah, was it Ry Ryan Daughter? Is it, 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 does she, does they, do they have, like, a couple of different names? Okay, that makes sense. I've never heard them being called gold. Okay, Pog. Okay, that makes a lot of sense now. Thank you, chat. Thank you. There's another reason why I think gold is the cause of all this. 
For a while, I suspected that Lumine of the Abyss Order was not really the boss of the Abyss. But there weren't enough clues and a direct indicator for me to prove this. Then at the end of the Archon Quest, just to make my life easier, Mihoyo drops a subtle foreshadowing. Oh. Paimon says, Still, we don't know for sure if our sibling is the highest ranking leader in the organization. <sighs> uh -huh. This dialogue alone gives me more of an incentive to say that Gold, who is probably still alive, is the king or the queen of the Abyss Order. Really? Our sibling obviously being the prince or the princess. Well, that changes a lot, though, because if that is the case, dude, and, and, and this next event that we're, or the next patch that we're getting in a, literally a few days has Albedo coming to the chasm. Oh, shit, dude. Okay. <laughs> so if this is all true, this explains Danny Slave's position rather well. Oh, no. But what is he planning and why does he ask us to defeat him inside the trailer? Okay, I know he's coming to Inazuma and not the chasm, but I am going to as bravely assume that the people that are coming to Inazuma might also make an appearance at the chasm. 500. Oh, God, dude. When we initially met Dainsleif under the pretext of hiring him for commission, he sets a few conditions. Three questions, 500 mora. The three questions are very cryptic in a sense, but ultimately attributes to how we feel towards humans and deities. In essence, it doesn't even really matter because Dainsleif himself says the answers say nothing about right and wrong. I mean, that's Regardless fair. of our answers, he accepts our commission anyway because we are looking for our sibling, which is associated with the okay. order. Again, I know I'm pausing this a lot, but I have a feeling that the reason that he might know this is because he has lived long enough to see the cycle already proceed and he knows that it doesn't matter. What if it just doesn't matter? The bigger question is, why in the world does he ask for 500 mora exactly? After mm. researching for many, many hours, I uncovered three things in the game that is associated with the number 500. The three things are the cataclysm that happened yep. 500 years ago, stellar reunion returnee quest that rewards you a prototype ranker for reaching 500 points, and lastly, Forging a what? weapon costs okay. 500 mora exactly. Now, in the beginning, I wasn't sure what to make of this. The whole 500 yeah, years ago thing felt too obvious to find any real meaning, considering Dainsleif was asking for mora. So instead, I researched more into the weapons that we can craft. If you mm -hmm. remember from the very, very beginning, weapons are made with. Quest, we find out that Dainsleif is looking for a particular crafting material, something that Wagner in Mondstadt has no knowledge of. Initially, I thought it was a star silver ore from Dragonspine, but I, I remember it this. didn't make sense. We literally craft items using star silvers from Wagner. Yeah, I so remember instead, this. I searched for answers from the prototype weapons. Long story short, prototype weapons originated from the Black Cliff Forge in Liyue after the Cataclysm. Interestingly, the prototype Amber was believed to bring forth primordial cosmic energy. And Jesus. this catalyst was secretly guarded within the forge for reasons unknown. Regardless, after these prototypes were created, the person who created the blueprints for these weapons wanted to enhance these weapons with better forging materials. Yo, this is making Using me more hype for the chasm. Crystals, which are known to be found in the depths of the chasm, he creates the black... Uh, uh, oh my god, dude, we are literally getting Dane Quest in the chasm. What is happening? Cliff crystals, which are known to be found in the depths of the chasm, he creates the Black Cliff Weapon series. Interestingly, it would make sense that this Black Cliff Crystal is unknown to Wagner in Mondstadt. Oh my the god. The idea of 500 Mora being an exact number for forging a weapon in this game suggests to me that Dainsleif is looking to forge a specific weapon, perhaps by using a specific material. But... For what reason? To kill everything. Now that might sound like I'm jumping the gun here, but consider this idea. Dainsleif completely despises the Abyss. If what I speculate about gold being the cause of the downfall, and gold is currently the true leader of the Abyss, this could be the unfinished business that Dainsleif wants to accomplish. And whether Lumine was Dainsleif's traveling companion or not, due to this hatred towards the Abyss and the current situation, Dainsleif wants the Abyss Order to be decimated and ended. So what's the only thing that would stop him? 
One of my favorite scenes character. in the whole game is that portal Whatever scene. Whatever Dainsleif's goals are and how he thinks about this world, we need to stop Dainsleif if we are to rescue our sibling from not only Dainsleif, but the Abyss as well. He even suggests that he wants us to defeat him to show that our cause is worthier than his. Defeat so doesn't mean kill though. This ridiculous, entangled, intertwined destiny of every faction and characters in this game. Also, Kaching right popped off here. And who is wrong? I don't think we're the good guys. And I've to said that honest, for a while ever now. Since we started the game, I don't think this is something that can be answered. Within many references that Genshin Impact takes from the real world, there is a very important concept that is continuously mentioned in the game. Under the teachings of Gnosticism, which Genshin Impact takes a lot of references from, there is a specific concept of syzygy that derives what? from the Valentinian traditions. Syzygy? The simplest way to describe it would be male and female. There is no light without darkness, or simply life and death. Now, within this concept, the whole <laughs> idea is that the two opposite is not considered right or wrong. But by the union of the two, we get the Aww. full understanding and, in essence, enlightenment. Now, why do I bring this up for Genshin Impact? As mentioned in my previous video, in Gnosticism, the true god, or Monad, felt bad by the fabricated nature of the world and its lies. To help humanity, this true god sends male and female pair called the Syzygy. The whole purpose is to guide and shed the light onto humanity so that they can achieve the true knowledge and true divinity. So with that, that concept Ganyu after killing the birds. of the two opposites in mind, our sibling already traveled through the world of Genshin Impact and knows the truth. We are suggested to do the same, not only by our sibling, but by Dainsleif as well. And once we uncover the truth, we will reunite at the final doorway to make a decision to change the nature of all things inside this world. So the whole idea of who's right and wrong, who's good and evil, None doesn't of really us. exist in this game. Yeah, Literally, no. everyone in this game is doing what they believe under their own circumstances and as Dainsleif said it's not about right or wrong just a difference in attitude yeah remember this is just a theory jesus dude listen that was the best one yet it might just be a theory but holy fuck it is a fucking good theory dude the unknown god's biggest mistake i i, I don't know Genshin what it is impact i, is I have no idea let's have a look game now, obviously, it does have some controversial moments, but once we dive into the game that's full of characters, interesting mechanics, and stories, it's a pretty enjoyable experience. Because how could However, they have been a mistake? there's one thing that boggles my mind, something that went completely unnoticed since the release of the game. The Unknown God loses before the game even starts. Well, now, she's stupid this then. Now, Unknown God is good or evil, this mistake would essentially cause her own demise. There are many unanswered questions in the story of Genshin Impact, but maybe by going all the way back to the beginning, we can potentially answer some questions regarding the mystery of the game. Okay, I'm down. Well, how did she mess the up unknown though? unknown god, also known as the sustainer of heavenly principles. As I discussed in my prior videos, we can notice that humans in this world continue to question and challenge the gods. With that said, it's safe to assume that the sustainer's goal is to rule over humans and make sure this world continues on. But if we were to backtrack to the opening minutes of the game, she mm -hmm. makes perhaps the biggest blunder that ultimately ruins her. She stops the twins from leaving. This causes some major problems for the sustainer. First, Lumine figures out that this world is screwed up. She empowers the Abyss Order, who wants to overthrow the gods. Second, Aether joins in years later to progress through the story and Built unintentionally a empowers the Saritza, who is also trying to overthrow the gods. To the sustainer, this cause and effect will undoubtedly come bite her in the ass in the future. So what should she have done? Killed nothing. them. Absolutely what? nothing. The cataclysm, which was caused by the Abyss Order 500 years ago, essentially ended up as a failure considering everything continued on as if nothing had happened fake down the if line Lumin had left in the beginning of the game she would have never joined the abyss order and regaining power would have been very difficult for the abyss order 
If Ether had left, he would have never woken up into VOD 500 years later. Due to what transpired after his reawakening, Saritza seizes this opportunity and takes control of the two no sees from Venti and Zhongli. Ether essentially aids in Saritza's goal to fight against the divine. By keeping the twins in this world, the sustainer Shit. is now faced with multiple factions that appear to have leveled up due to the twins joining in the story. Now I know what you're thinking. If the sustainer had let them leave, that would be a terrible story. Quite frankly, yeah, the I mean, wouldn't it exist, would. or the story would have had to be rewritten. But I... for the sake of the theory... It... I'll be honest, I feel like Mahoyo, since it was Mahoyo at this point, uh, would have still been able to tell a really good story either way. I, I don't feel like that is the reason that she forced them to stay. I feel like maybe she's been forced to like keep the cyclical nature going and she knew that she had to or something, but I think there's more to it. I think there's got to be a reason. Uh, but again, just, I guess, theory stuff. If the stuff. sustainer of Heavenly Principle is a god that controls everything in this world, how could she have made such a silly mistake? She didn't. I don't think in she did. In my theory, the mistake of keeping the twins in this world stems from a simple misunderstanding. When the sustainer first showed herself, she claims the arrogation of mankind ends now. The sustainer believed that the twins were humans. Considering what was going on at that mm. time regarding the cataclysm and Conria, the sustainer was already under immense pressure due to the humans potentially challenging this world. To further this misunderstanding, Lumin questions who she is. To the sustainer, this question means, oh, they don't know who I am. They <laughs> must not be divine beings, so oh, probably God. human. After all, no human should know my existence. Well, they look human. They probably are. So the sustainer tells the twins exactly who she is. The sustainer of heavenly principles. Now this act of giving well. identity away means one thing. The classic case of, I'm telling you who I am because I'm about to end your life. If the twins no. are in fact I have, I have a totally different thought on this. A totally different thought. Um, I... Because I've played a lot of cyclical games before, like Dark Souls, for example, and you know that the main characters, like the, who are your friends even, uh, basically want you to go down this path to sacrifice yourself to keep the cycle going, and they know you're going to come back. I have a feeling it's the same thing. The sustainer of heavenly principles has to sustain the heavenly principles, and I think she locked them into this place because maybe um she knows that she wants the cycle to continue and not break because if the cycle breaks then who knows what's going to happen uh that's that was my theory since day one but I, I could be totally wrong i don't know it's a very interesting uh comparison definitely interesting uh theory i like this one the battle would have been extremely easy for the sustainer but we know that wasn't the case lumin and ether are still alive from mm -hmm. our gameplay we know that the twins are not humans they don't age and they don't even require visions to use elemental powers. It's probably safe to assume that the twins are godly beings from another world. Now, if the sustainer was That's wasn't the confusing part. What God, are we? She should have been able to tell immediately that the twins were not human. But from the hints in the game, we can learn that the sustainer isn't as powerful as we first believed. Yeah, I also think she's not that powerful. Inside the Traveler's story description, it mentions... The sustainer is dying. The creator has yet to arrive, but the world won't burn again because you will ascend to the seat of God. We can notice that this description is written in a very strange- Hold the fuck up. That's in the game, dude? <laughs> Wait, what? That's in the game? Yet to arrive, but the world won't burn again because you will ascend to the seat of God. We can notice that this description is written in a very strange manner almost as if it's a foreshadowing of some sort. Now, from this description, we can take away three key points. Chinese First, translation. the sustainer is capable of dying. Second, the creator is a different being entirely from yeah. the sustainer. And third, the traveler can potentially ascend to the seat of God. From these three yes. points, I would argue that the sustainer isn't all that powerful. She's merely a puppet of a higher being, simply there with the task of doing her job. We've her seen job that before. Sustaining this world using the laws of heavenly principles. This would mean that whoever is above her created the world and its laws, the creator. But who is this creator? 
Going off of Gnosticism, which I explained in this video, I theorize that the creator is the fake god. A Interesting. A complete different being from the sustainer. Now, why did the creator disappear? Honestly, I have no clue. But going back to the sustainer, Interesting. he is not as powerful as we originally thought. This could explain the first couple minutes of the game. The sustainer doesn't know everything. She's not an omnipotent being, which causes her misunderstanding. Also, the fact that the twins never explained their goals or who they were creates further confusion. If the sustainer had realized sooner, she could have just let them go to the next world and they would never interfere with her job. But the battle had already begun and they start to fight for survival. Assuming God damn. the twins are godly beings from another world, the sustainer quickly figures out that she wasn't strong enough to take them down. The only thing the sustainer could do was to delay the twins by separating them and sealing them away. Yeah, that, this, that one line in the game starts the ticking time bomb. Also, I'm very sorry. When I first saw away. this, I didn't really this, understand what it was because it looks like a, a girl with really long wavy hair with two arms and then a huge ass. What are the two things that look like a big ass? I think... I don't know, dude. Uh, the cape? Hair? I don't know. Either way, I'll carry on. Starts the ticking time bomb. It's a cape? Obviously, oh. this game isn't even finished, and this is nothing but theories and speculations. And I also understand keeping the twins in this world could be simply explained as a plot trigger created by MiHoYo with no real reason. You know, just to start the game. But since this mm. is a theory video, we cannot completely dismiss alternative possibilities. For example, True. is it possible that the sustainer kept the twins here for a reason? Considering there are a lot of speculations regarding Paimon being the sustainer or even the god of time itself, who knows? Maybe the sustainer also got tired of the laws of this world, just like Venti and Zhongli. And maybe she low-key stopped the siblings from leaving so that they can end this world that was manufactured by the creator. Could the end of Genshin Impact signal a new beginning that connects the MiHoYo universe with the creator being the final uh, boss? Let me know in the so comments. So I think, I think, because Island does a lot of Honkai stuff. That Island does like a lot of Honkai stuff and he knows like a lot about that game. Now listen, I'm, I'm a bit of a simp for Kazuha. We all know this. I, I am a little bit of a simp for Kazuha. Kazuha's great. So I'm excited to see this one. Beginning of the end though. That gives me bad vibes. Here we go. Hayadehara Kazuha, the Canadian ether. While we <laughs> meme and joke about this aesthetic choice, what if I told you that every single aspect about Kazuha was carefully manufactured before the game even released? What is the significance of the maple leaf and his animal vision? Is the release of Kazuha at this moment in the story a simple coincidence? Or is it hmm. a deeper connection of what's to come? Who knows? Just like myself, it's very probable that when you saw Kazuha for the very first time, you probably thought that he's a pyro user rather than an animal user. This in part would be because Kazuha's color scheme revolving around the so shade this before of red he came out as a playable character? green, which would fit the color of animal a lot better. <laughs> but if we dive into the rabbit hole once again, the maple leaf, which is Kazuha's most prominent aesthetic trait, might have some deeper meaning that connects him to the overall story of the game. Now, when we think of the maple leaf, nine times out of ten, the color that you'd picture in your mind would be red. some shade of red. But we Autumn forget leaves. that the color of the maple leaf. I also noticed chat, and sorry, I know this is a little bit off topic, but in the other video that I watched, the Kadahara Kazuha animation, um, it was very, very cute, and I realized how long it must have been, because when he met his friend, the the maple leaves were green, and then in this in the scene of everything happening, they, when they were falling, they were like crimson red, dude. Oh god, it was so it was so sad. Is actually green and changes into the shade of red during the season of autumn. Yeah. Interestingly, throughout Kazuha's description, it mentions autumn several times as if to say he has some connections to this season. Now, before I explain what the significance of autumn has in Genshin Impact, this season also causes some peculiar effects on one's emotions, scientifically known as the seasonal affective disorder. The oh, people with these sad. conditions often <laughs> feel depressed and hopeless at the start of the fall, which continues throughout the winter shout out to my sad friends if you will now what does this change mean for kazuha and the story of genshin impact the seasonal release depression. of kazuha signifies the beginning of change let me explain 
Kazuha was born of nobility, but he never cared for such things. He enjoyed peace and always dreamed of traveling as a wanderer throughout the world. When he first took over as the head of the clan, it just so happens that his clan was already on a decline. Coincidentally to Kazuha, this was a breath of fresh air. He could finally do something that he always dreamed of. So he left on a journey. One hmm. summer, Kazuha meets and travels with a merchant who quickly becomes his close friend. Oh. After a short while, they go their separate ways, hoping to see each other once again. I Immediately can't, following that summer, the region of Inazuma begins the vision hunt decree. Being oh. a vision wielder himself, Kazuha goes into hiding, only to find out that his merchant friend, who also had a vision, requested a duel by putting his life on the line. Dude, Upon I don't hearing the do news, this. Kazuha rushes to the palace. Can I skip this one? When he arrived, his friend had already lost his duel against a character named Kujo Sara and was facing divine judgment from Raiden Shogun herself. Oh. Seeing this event unfold in front of his eyes, Kazuha could not bear to watch his friend's hopes and dreams get mounted onto the statue of the thousand-armed, hundred-eyed god. So he retrieves his friend's now inactive vision and escapes. Oh. This parting between Kazuha and his friend happens in autumn, immediately following the summer that they had just met. In the aftermath of this event, Kazuha mentions that he no longer likes the rain as he once did as a child. Oh. Rain often representing the season of summer, the summer that brings back the memory of his friend and the following fall which he lost him in the incident. Now to go back to the symbolism of the maple leaf, this change in Kazuha's life reflects the cycle of the maple leaf itself. Yeah. The green lustrous See? symbol that became you, dyed in red in autumn. The oh. happiness of his travel, which ultimately ended in bloodshed. This traumatic experience and the burden that Kazuha now carries also explains why he holds the animal vision in the first place. Many people have speculated that the animal vision are given to individuals with a specific trait, to people who want to protect something. While this may sound somewhat reasonable, I want to give a different perspective that not only explains the animal vision, but how Kazuha's release could affect the future of the game. Oh god. Japanese maple is not always green though. Nobody said it's always green. It said it's green in the in the in the summer and red in the fall. The concept of animal characters can be described by the following statement. Past burdens that shackles them down, which drives them to a specific goal. Before the release of Kazuha, there were four animal characters. Jean, Sucrose, Xiao, and Venti. Now of these four characters, Xiao and Venti are somewhat of an anomaly. Venti's vision is fake True. and Xiao's vision is essentially for looks, something that he carries around to fit into humanity's perception to avoid suspicion. Very After cute. all, Xiao's powers originate from his third eye since he is an adeptus. Regardless, the concept of burden and shackles still applies to the animal characters. The simplest to explain are Jean and Xiao. Burdened by the history of the Gunhilder family, Jean has no choice but to continue her protection duties of Mondstadt. In the case of Xiao, Jean his needs to take a break, past, dude. Fighting evil and losing his friends ultimately made him who he is today. Out of responsibility, Xiao continues to go down the path of defeating evil. The story of Sucrose and Venti gets a bit tricky, Ooh, but the idea Sucrose. is still the same. Sucrose is burdened by a promise she made with her friends. Later, her friends left and never came back. But her promise, which she intends to keep, essentially shackles her down to this day. A promise to search for an undiscovered domain that reflects the pinnacle of perfection. And finally, what? we have Venti, the animal archon that seems to know just about everything. Being an archon and perhaps due to his connection to Celestia, he is burdened with the secrets that he cannot disclose. As I partially mentioned in this video, regardless of what these secrets are, because of his identity as the animal archon, he must continue to push the story forward. Interestingly, the concept of Masta and Barbados' representation of freedom also makes sense when we understand this concept to break free from the burdens and shackles, a concept that perfectly mirrors the story of Vanessa. The, in manga, the manga looks really well. good. As yeah, I, see, I need to read the manga. These characters all share a very similar pattern. With yeah, animal. A past burden, a shackle oh. <laughs> that forces them on a specific path. Now, the question is, what is this path that Kazuha is on? Vengeance? From what we can gather from the version 1.6 Midsummer Island Adventure trailer, his goal is to reignite his friend's vision, which has become inactive and potentially returned to Inazuma. As so, does he think... Uh, genuine question here, chat. 
Um, does does Kazuha think, and I don't know if it's confirmed if it's true or not, that um, if you have enough ambition, it can fill up two visions, not just one? It's basically the truth, I think, right? I, I like I don't know. I mean, we saw the vision literally flicker, right? We saw it in the in the in the part where he d defended himself. Well, defended us, I guess, against Raiden. We still don't know. Not confirmed. They didn't explain. Fuck. 1.6 Midsummer Island Adventure trailer. His goal is to reignite his friend's vision, which has become inactive and potentially returned to Inazuma. As for the details on why he wants to return to Inazuma is yet unclear. But judging by the death of his friend and how he disagrees with oh, the concept shit. of taking away freedom, hopes, and dreams due to the vision so hunt degree, it wouldn't be a surprise if Kazuha wanted to return to either assist in the resistance or seek some kind of closure. Another thing to consider is that Kazuha joined the Crux fleet of Beidou on a temporary basis, suggesting that whatever happens in the story of Kazuha, one way or another, will ultimately lead us into Inazuma for the next part of the story. So... When are we going to Inazuma? Roadmap? Yeah, did you like make going your own? Because I swear to God, Bahoya didn't give us one. Earlier, I want to cautiously speculate to explain a potential roadmap that Mihoyo has been planning before the game even launched. <laughs> Genshin Impact officially released on September 28th, the fall of 2020. The Vision Hunt Decree, which ultimately ended Kazuha's journey, happened one year prior to the start of the game, the okay. fall of 2019. The reason why I even bring this up is the possibility that the season of autumn or fall is a crucial indicator that something may change within the story. The story of Genshin Impact seems to follow a cyclical repetition of seasons represented in the lore of the prayer's artifacts. Here's a graph representing the timeline since the release of the what? game so I can help you better understand. The game releases in fall of 2020. Then we arrive to winter of 2020, representing the unending ice mentioned in the prayers to springtime artifact. Oh my god, Later, it's right though. spring arrives in 2021, reflecting the description of prayers for illumination, which mentions the thawing of ice and the first fires. Then into summer of 2021, which is represented by the prayers for destiny, an artifact that describes the first falling rain. Again, rain symbolizing the season of what? summer. Coincidentally, rain that Kazuha now dislikes. A summer bringing back the memories of his friend. Only to lose him now? in the Chasm? following fall. Now we have the last of the four artifacts. The Prayer what? of Wisdom. An artifact that represents the season of fall. And it reads, The waters ran dry as the thunder first pierced the skies. To question eternity was forbidden. Thunder what? <laughs> and eternity symbolizing the Archon of Inazuma. Summer, where what? we are at now, reflecting the lightheartedness of the Golden Apple Archipelago, which we can take as the calm before the storm. Now we are faced with the impending fall of 2021, a season that represents change, all set in place by a burden of Kazuha, which will take all of us into Inazuma, a green maple leaf that will be dyed in red. Is the release of Kazuha in the summer of 2021 purely coincidental? How much of this was planned by Mihoyo since the beginning? Let me know what your thoughts in the fuck? comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like, consider subscribing, and check out my other videos. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. I try to process what the fuck just happened. Hold up. <laughs> that kind of... Okay, I know this is theorizing, but that kind of makes too much sense. Now I want to check every artifact description and... and, and Oh my god, Island, you fucking genius, dude. Raiden Shogun's hidden motive. With Inazuma just around the corner, there are many questions awaiting to be answered. What's the motive behind Raiden Shogun's actions? What's the reason behind the Vision Hunt Decree? And what or who does this statue represent? Although we'll find out eventually purely out of entertainment, I want to theorize on this topic using in-game references and real-life inspiration that Mihoyo used to create the story of Inazuma. This makes sense. This makes a lot of sense. Throughout the game, Raiden Shogun has been portrayed to we be already know, an right? antagonistic Not the figure. statue, the but people of Inazuma the other stuff. claiming that her view of the people is inconsequential. Many believing that she is simply scared to lose her power and rule. But how much of this is actually true? 
If we take a quick moment to think about the bigger picture, the current narrative of Inazuma has only been told by the perspective of humans. And as humans, the enforcement of the Vision Hunt decree is perceived as a restriction set upon the symbol of hope and dreams. But I want to cautiously remind you that our belief about visions may be a perception that had slowly manifesting itself Ooh. because of our association with the humans and Tabat. Okay, if you take fair a moment point. to think about it, to someone like Daneslave, his views on visions are with a negative connotation, and the Archons never really gave us a clear answer on how they feel about visions. Not until Raiden Shogun. So what's her deal? Why is she being portrayed with such an antagonistic vibe? In the hopes to better understand well, her actions, we need to track down where mm -hmm. the Vision Hunt decree got its inspiration from. So this is definitely before the, the Inazuma storyline, definitely before it ended, and I think probably before it fully started. Uh, if we can get confirmation in chat, I think before it fully started. Um, before the release? Holy shit. This, so this is this is theory crafting purely based on uh, information before the actual release. God damn. Bonk, have a good night. Um, that's interesting. Okay, this this is exciting, and I want to see what he what he came up with before it came out. Um, the Vision Hunt decree originates from what's known as the Sword Hunt within the history of Japan, and of its four different variations, the second Sword Hunt, which was enforced by Toyotomi Hideyoshi during the Sengoku period, closely resembles the story of Inazuma. There are three distinctive correlations that can be seen when we compare the Sword Hunt to the Vision Hunt decree. First, okay. people were forced to give up their weapons. If they wanted to wield weapons, they had to work under the ruling body as a military samurai. This correlation can be directly seen in the game within the story of Kujosara, an yep. officer that works under the ruling body who is seen utilizing her electro vision. Second, the sword hunt was followed by an expulsion edict, an act of monitoring and expelling anyone coming in or out of villages, mirroring the Sakoku decree of Inazuma, wow. which okay. was issued by the Shogun to shut down its borders. And finally, the confiscated weapons were melted down to forge a statue of Buddha, a sign of hope and prosperity for generations to come, represented in the game as the inlaying of visions upon the statue of the <laughs> thousand-armed hundred-eyed god, which wow. I will describe in detail later in this video. As you can see from these three descriptions, the correlation is obvious. But what was the reason behind this? Okay, dude. Hunt? But that was, uh, yeah, it's obvious, dude. dude no, I, I mean, I, I didn't know half of the stuff that you just said. Like, it's cool to know now, but I would have had no idea. That's super cool. Koyotomi Hideyoshi's sword hunt had a simple goal in mind a unification of the nation through the ruling body for prolonged prosperity. With this ideology, Raiden's motives can be easily explained. Centralization of power upon the ruling body for a never-changing eternity. Just like other Archons in the game, Raiden Shogun has her own ideals and methods. And as an Archon, how the people perceive her is inconsequential. For instance, Venti, being a bard, utilizes mm. stories and poetry to portray his idea of freedom, as he believes that's the best way to lead the nation of Mondstadt. John Lee being a consultant employs rules and guidelines to represent his ideals of contracts, as he also believes that's the best course of action for the nation of Liyue. Now, Raiden, the Shogun. As the Shogun, she uses her dictatorial powers and ruling body to pursue her goal of eternity. Again, a method that she believes is correct for the nation of Inazuma. Yeah, now, regardless of Raiden Shogun's <laughs> methods being good or evil in the eyes of humans, just like Venti and Zhongli, she wants the best for her nation. But how does visions get in the way of her nation and her value of eternity? Suffering. Oh, God. Tepe. To get to the bottom of why visions are a hindrance to Raiden Shogun, let's talk about the statue of the Thousand Armed Hundred Eyed God. After mm -hmm. all, this is the statue that the visions are getting mounted on. As I mentioned earlier, during the second sword hunt, weapons were confiscated to create a statue of Buddha, a sign of hope and prosperity. With that in mind, within the belief of Buddhism, there's an entity called the Bohitsava Avalokiteshvara. For simplicity, Ooh. let's call this by its Japanese name, Kainan. 
Kanan okay. is a being that is capable of ascension, but instead of ascending, she decided to stay behind, postponing her own nirvana to free all sentient beings from samsara. A much simpler explanation, she stays behind in the mortal realm to help release humans from suffering. Samsara meaning suffering, which is believed to be caused by the process of death and rebirth. Within the story of Genshin Impact, one source of suffering stems from the cycle of repetition forced upon humans by the divinity, which I previously explained in this video. A never-ending cycle of death and rebirth, which oh is obviously God. being represented with the statue of Kanan. Now in the case of Raiden Shogun, she seems to be more fixated on a different source of suffering. A suffering that stems from visions. Throughout the game, humans are constantly seen lusting and complaining due to their lack of visions. Even mm -hmm. if they had visions, some question its existence and ponder oh, over its implications. We need more now, from recent events in the game and in the trailers, it is explained that one criteria for obtaining vision depends on one's excessive level of ambition, a criteria that Kazuha wonders if Raiden Shogun disagrees with. In reality, studies show that too much ambition ambition often leads to poor mental health. A high level of ambition often contributing to frustration, depression, and suffering. Just mm -hmm. like how Toyotomi Hideyoshi forcibly removed the problem that could hinder the unification and prosperity, Raiden Shogun's action of completely Dude. removing the source of suffering by inlaying the visions onto Dude. a statue which represents empathy starts to make sense. This Albeit is so done on in point. a tutorial way, which she still believes is the best method. Interestingly, at the end of the Ark Conquest in Liyue, Zhong Li has some interesting dialogues regarding visions and Raiden Shogun. First, he mentions humans bemoan their lack of power, as if to say humans continuously suffer to seek after visions as a source of reliance. He then continues, in the eyes of Raiden Shogun, visions should be under the sole dominion of divinity, suggesting that visions innate suffering should be shouldered by the ruling body and the symbol of Kanan, which would release humans from suffering. Now at the very oh, end of Zhongli's dialogue, he concludes with another peculiar statement. The fact that even I, the oldest of the seven, have now passed away will only strengthen Raiden's resolve to pursue eternity. Could oh, Zhongli be God. hinting that his retirement had something to do with Raiden Shogun's actions? What exactly happened one year ago that caused the beginning of the Vision Hunt Decree? change even after the cataclysm that occurred 500 years ago which caused the death and replacement of the dendro archon raiden never took action the world of tava continued with Weed. each archon overlooking their own region but raiden's demeanor seemingly changed one year ago with the start of the vision hunt decree as True. for the reasons why is yet unclear but if i were to theorize i believe that her change in perception could be related to zhongli when really? we spoke with Madame Ping to borrow the cleansing bell, she mentioned, I guess that perhaps an old friend of mine has finally decided to take matters into their own hands. Possibly mm. hinting that Zhong Li's plan to change Li Wei was already known to certain individuals. If Madame Ping knew, was there anyone else? Someone who knows Zhong Li's identity? Raiden Shogun and Yae Miko. It was officially confirmed during the version 1.5 Chinese livestream that Raiden, Zhongli, and Yae were old friends. It wouldn't be surprising if Raiden and Yae both knew about Zhongli's plan to a certain degree. But how did Raiden know exactly when this event was going to take place? Holy shit, dude. the Raiden dissension in Liyue is a yearly event. Obviously, the most recent one being the last. That would mean that after the Rite of Dissension in the previous year, Zhong Li started to formulate a plan to fake his death with the help of the Saritza. Around the same time, the Vision Hunt Decree began. Although the details behind why Zhong Li assisted Saritza is bound by a contract, the basic details on how and who he worked with isn't much of a secret. You know this scene right here, chat? This, uh, this scene right here gave me very... And this might sound really odd to a lot of people. It really, really, really might. Um, but with with him being the god of contracts and stuff, I did get mad. But the more I looked into it, or like the the more I looked just deeper from the actual surface of as what was going on, it gave me uh, Doctor Strange vibes. 
instead of sketchy vibes, it gave me Doctor Strange vibes. This all-knowing god of contracts put a contract in place to give away this literal thing thing that could change the course of reality. Whereas in like Endgame, Doctor Strange uh, saw all the different futures and knew that only one was the right one, so gave away the Time Stone to Thanos, right? Gave away the, the biggest piece of the puzzle to the enemy. But it still worked out in the end, right? So it gave me vibes like that. So I started to look at it a little bit differently, uh, which is very interesting. Sarita could be Thanos in that sense, or uh, it could have been, I guess, uh, I, I guess it could have been Signora. Um, but it just made me think a lot. I, I, I literally, I put the two next to each other and I, I watched it and I watched both of them back and I was like, oh shit, they're so unreasonably similar that uh it, it kind of blew my mind like they really are similar when you watch them back together secret it's after cool. all he did tell the traveler in the aftermath that means it's entirely possible that Raiden Shogun knew of the changes that were approaching in the world of Tabat at least a year before the death of Morox it's also yep. possible that Raiden knew of Saritza's involvement to change this world's rule now I want to remind you we cannot ignore the fact that Raiden Shogun is one of the Archons the ones who knows the truth behind this world, but refuses to divulge his information, just like <laughs> Venti and Zhongli. But yeah, unlike pretty much. Venti, whose ideal is based around people being freed from shackles, and Zhongli, whose ideals begins and ends with the concept of contracts, Raiden is in a complete different situation because her ideals of an unchanging eternity for her nation. Now, even if Raiden wants to end the suffering of her people with the lack of clear answers from the Shogun, it makes sense that the perception of the people in Inazuma are confused enough to start a resistance. So what could be the saving grace for the nation of Inazuma? Oh my god, dude. I'm sure you have many questions regarding Yayamiko. As for what role she plays in the story of Inazuma is unclear. But many of you have probably been thinking, why does the statue of the Thousand Art Hundred Eye God resemble Yai? During the version 2.0 livestream, Xiao Lohao, the head of concept and story team, dropped a very important ideology. The head of concept is called Xiao. I love that. Zuma. Instant flash of lightning that transpires into eternity. This concept was also confirmed to be connected to both Yai and Raiden Shogun. If the instantaneous change in Raiden Shogun's demeanor signifies the flash of lightning, that could mean that the symbol of eternity has something to do with the chief priest of the Narukami shrine. But why Yae Miko? I don't think it looks do like Yae. Do I have any evidence? By going back to the statue of Kenon, we may be able to find some connections between Kenon, Yae Miko, and the statue. Oh, did people think that Yai was the Electro Archon? <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. So what kind of role would Yai and Miko play in the story of Inazuma? Without a doubt, she will be an integral part of the story. True. But to what end? Although we will find out eventually, for the sake of theorizing, we might be able to get a vague idea by connecting some dots. To be fair, I can understand why. Between Kenon, the statue in the game, and Yai and Miko. As we discussed wait a second so uh, chat correct me if i'm wrong here the statues in each region are different right the statue, in the, the statue in each region are different i think i think i could be very fucking wrong here but yes okay this statue here do they all wear the same necklace why does this statue have like a necklace looking like the uh the eye of the storm why is that a thing if you look at the bottom right the necklace looks like uh the eye of the storm enemy with the swirls because it's the roth maybe electroloculus it doesn't look like an electroloculus to me it looks way more like a like a eye of the eye of the storm that's interesting it, it, either way it's interesting i think it looks like eye of the storm Game let's, let's continue <laughs> as we discussed earlier Kenon delayed her own ascension to save humans from suffering but mm. because there were so many people that needed help Kenon ended up manifesting extra arms and heads giving her the name the thousand arm thousand eye mirroring the name of the statue in the game the thousand armed hundred eyes besides okay. this obvious similarity there are many other aesthetic choices from Kanon that had been translated into the statue in game and yai as well for example Kanon was known to have a fanned peacock-like tail 
often seen wearing a necklace. Again, Pretty cool. two similarities that are shown on the statue. Now, if you start to add Yaya into the it equation, really does look like things a... become even more interesting. The storm. Kanan was shown in many representations of having a halo along with the necklace, often wearing a white robe and many paintings depicting her with the colors white and red, all traits which represents the design of Yaya herself. To further add to this correlation, Kanan is represented with the lotus flower power. The mm. same flower embedded in Yai's necklace and her halo-like crown. To cap it all off, is that what that is? sometimes shown alongside oh. a chilin. Chilin, obviously being Ganyu inside Genshin Impact, and interestingly enough, Ganyu was also confirmed to be associated with Yae during the version 1.5 Chinese livestream. There's an obvious correlation here between Kenon, Yae Miko, and the statue. But why? Since Inazuma has yet to be released, the answer isn't so obvious. But judging from the ideas that we have formulated in this video, we might be able to get a grasp of the situation within the story of Inazuma. Oh. Raiden Shogun has realized that there's a change looming on the horizon. To pursue her Could ideals of eternity and to lead her nation, she begins to take matters into her own hands in a method that she knows best, the enforcement of rules by using her status as the Shogun. Although her actions may be seen as abuse of power to the people of Inazuma, she is ultimately trying to accomplish a unification of her nation by removing the source of suffering caused by the vision, all through the idea of empathy represented by the statue and and the involvement of Yae Miko, who is it's represented so cool as to the living to these embodiment theories, dude. of Kanon herself. The Vision Hunt decree symbolized as the flash of instantaneous lightning, a beginning of change that will bring forth prosperity and a never changing eternity for the nation of Inazuma. Now you may be thinking, bruh, you're looking into this way too deeply. Why is Shogun <laughs> is just scared to lose her powers? You may be correct. <laughs> this is just my own theory after all. <laughs> However, if I learned anything from playing through the game of Genshin Impact and spending months researching its story, I can Listen, say no, without it. It's funny now. It wouldn't have been funny then, but it's funny now because we know, okay? <laughs> shadow of a doubt there's more to the story of this game than meets the eyes we yes. cannot take everything at its face value and to Agreed. be frank even this video because remember this is just a theory if you enjoyed this video smash like consider subscribing and make sure to check out my other videos on Kamisato Ayaka, Five Hidden Symbolisms. I will explain five secret symbolisms within Kamisato Ayaka that you might not have known. When we think of Ayaka from within the game, there are a few things that stand out immediately. The Kyo five head. Vision, I'm kidding. The katana I'm kidding. and the tea. I'm kidding. Please don't cancel me. I'm kidding. I love Ayaka. I think she's great. I think she's so good. Uh, she's one of my favorite characters. Honestly, she really is. House owned by her clan. Now, these things might as well have been random aesthetic choice by MiHoYo to create a stylish character. But everything can be explained from a singular item that's in Ayaka's possession. The fan. There are many different types of fans in the culture of Japan, and the one in Ayaka's possession is a type of a fan used in traditional Japanese theater, known as Kabuki. Soundwave, kabuki thank you for the five months. Kabuki is a play showcasing stories of the past and folklore. The dancer performs in silence, which is often accompanied by music. <gasps> the mask. And the fan is utilized as an extension of vocabulary, signifying things such as the falling snow, a sword, drinking or serving tea, and even the blooming of a flower. This correlation of Kabuki is made obvious within the details of Ayaka. Her normal attack is literally called Kabuki, and not to mention, at the end Ooh. of her story quest, she gives us a dance performance using her fan, which mirrors the concept of Kabuki directly. In Can I be honest? I think that singular scene in Genshin Impact where she dances in the lake if I can remove the part where she's wearing socks, I think that might be one of my top three scenes in the entire game so far. In a very so good. simple sense, the fan symbolism of Kabuki literally encompasses everything that has to do with Ayaka. A cryo vision representing the falling of snow, the katana as her weapon, and the Komori tea house reflecting the drinking and serving of tea. Mm -hmm. what Where Toma gets food poisoning. Flower? The flower can be explained if we take a closer look at the design of her fan, the white sakura. 
To many of us, sakura blossom or cherry blossom are often thought of having a pink color. Although this perception yeah. is correct, the sakura blossom are also known to have a color of white. In Ayaka's case, the color white seems to fit her very well, considering she represents the color of snow. Now, aside from its color, the sakura blossom represents a time of renewal in Japanese culture. The same ideology that Ayaka is trying to pursue. The renewal of happiness for the people of Inazuma accompanied by her optimism. In terms of its aesthetics, the sakura flower is often depicted with five petals, which we mm -hmm. can notice in multiple places relating to Ayaka's character design. First, the white five-petaled flower found on her fan. Second, the flowers on her outfit. Does that East Coast bring a even the is it a emblem flower? of no. the Kamisato clan, which is surrounded by a glacier of ice? Not to mention the Sakura. God, that's blue, interesting. Which that's is cool. Also, an item that is needed to ascend Ayaka inside the game. Now, aside from the symbolism of renewal and optimism associated the with the flower, there is another part to its meaning. Due to their quick blooming season and the accelerated life cycle, the sakura flowers are also represented to symbolize the shortness of life and its happiness. This can be seen within the story of Ayaka's parents, where they oh. lost their lives at a seemingly young age compared to the normal lifespan of humans. This shortness of happiness might also be represented by what's to come within the story. The oh, shroud God. of gloominess surrounding the story of Inazuma. Now, if we take a step back, aside from the fan and the sakura flower, there is another yeah. interesting... I mean, I ain't gonna lie, dude. Inazuma, from start to finish, it was a fucking depression overlord. <laughs> it was great. The, the story quests were wonderful, but holy shit, dude. They hate kids, and they just hate... And they, they want kids to hate you. They want you to hate kids. They, they literally had a kid make you go hide a bomb. It's it's crazy, dude. Inazuma was the, was the depression arc of this anime symbolism within the design of Ayaka that describes her story in more detail. When we talk oh. about the color theme of Ayaka, there are three obvious distinctions. Blue, gold, pink, blue, gold. and white. Gold I is very simple to explain. Hold up. What? Really? Those are the three colors that you pick for Ayaka? Gold, blue, and white? Why do I automatically go to blue, pink, and, and like blue pink and white or blue pink and something else why is pink i i the pink grabs my eye more than the gold i don't know just for me Thank i guess you. gold blue and white gold is very simple to explain in its simplest form gold represents but gold makes more sense for the lore as well i guess <laughs> the trim of gold found on ayaka's outfit which is also represented on the emblem of the kamisato clan now the mm -hmm. representation of blue gets very interesting during the aristocracy period in Japan, there used to be a social system that was associated with colors. Within this system, certain colors were restricted to be worn by commoners. To commoners, oh, these restricted colors were known as the forbidden colors. But of all the different type of colors within this social system, blue, which also represents wealth and prestige just like gold, was a color that could be worn by nobles as well as commoners. Interestingly, in the design of Ayaka's fan, we can notice that the color gold seemingly fades into blue, symbolizing yes. Ayaka and the Kamisato clan acting as a bridge between the nobles and commoners. Obviously, yeah, to be fair, to be fair, her overall design definitely does have those three colors more than anything else. It was just the actual outfit with the pink that kind of drew the pink stood out more than the gold to me. But everything else, like with the fan, the fan is definitely the three colors that he mentioned. The weapon also, the I would say. Blue. In, in Japanese culture, blue and white are both used as a representation of purity and transparency. Another oh. trait that fits Ayaka's personality. And she is very pure. Well. Now, as if these three symbolisms of the fan, sakura flower, and colors weren't already enough, Mihoyo takes a symbolism within Ayaka a step further. Mm -hmm. Kamisato Ayaka has few different type of titles. Shirasagi Himegimi, an honorary title given by the people of Inazuma. The Frost Flake Heron, which was given by the developers, and her constellation Grus Nevis. Ooh, All three okay. of these titles can be traced back to one common theme. A white crane or a white heron. The oh, title no. of Shirasage Himegimi originates from a popular Japanese folk character known as Hagi Muzume, who is also known as the White Heron Princess. The story of this character was often depicted and represented in various accounts in Kabuki, the type of Japanese play that I covered earlier. 
Tagi Muzume's basic backstory is of a white heron who turned into human. Now with that in mind, if we look at the meaning behind a white crane or heron in Japanese culture, huh? it mirrors Ayaka's story to almost perfection. White cranes are adored and cherished as a symbol of discipline, fidelity, and vigilance. Yeah, but they Cloudridge. are believed to be messengers who serve as guides in the time of anxiety and imbalance. These white cranes or herons were known to help bring light in times of darkness to celebrate love and joy in human lives. Simply, the white crane or a messenger of guidance is being symbolized in the story of Ayaka. No, I know it's not literal. I know she didn't literally turn it from a bird into Ayaka, but it's interesting still. Now, with the concept of white crane explained, there is one last symbolism that I want to cover. Yeah. If you played through the story quest of Ayaka, you may have noticed the strange title of the story quest, The Whispers of the Crane and the White Rabbit. In Asian culture, the white rabbit is often represented as a type of everlasting figure living on the moon. The white rabbit, or Yuki Usagi, are also commonly made as a snow sculpture in Japan. That's cute. In That's really cute. one version of the snow rabbit story, a farmer's wife was tricked and murdered by a tanuki, and the rabbit felt sorry for the farmer and promised to take revenge. The rabbit tricks the tanuki and pretends to be its friend. During Toxic. their friendly alliance, the rabbit continues to harass the tanuki constantly and ultimately ends up drowning the tanuki to take revenge and keep his promise with the farmer. What In the a fuck? roundabout way, this whole story of the white rabbit also partially reflects the story of Ayaka. Ayaka and what? the comics of the clan is under the rule of the shogunate of Inazuma. To help the local people, Ayaka is attempting to fix the problem behind Raiden Shogun's back secretly, perhaps to keep her promise that coincides with the nature of her Kamisato clan, working tirelessly to help the people of Inazuma for joy and happiness. With this many details put into Ayaka, beginning with the accessory like the fan, ascension material, and even colors, I'm surprised that the design team hasn't gone crazy. Maybe I'm overanalyzing it. What do you think? Do you know of any other uh, symbolism about well. Ayaka not covered in this video? Let me know in the comments below. Uh, and if you enjoyed this video, <laughs> smash like and consider subscribing <laughs> for more future content on this channel. No, Thank I you think for you watching, got it. And I'll see you next time. Yeah, no, I think you got it perfectly. I think that's great. Yeah, I don't think you uh, missed anything. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think she killed everyone. <laughs> Holy shit, dude.